While the con crew continues its work, we'll take uh, opportunity now to uh, uh, welcome Cheryl Malloy uh, to the uh, International Space Station Flight Control Room. Cheryl's on a phone, but she's uh, located down at the Kennedy Space Center in uh, Florida. Uh, Cheryl, uh, welcome. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I wish I'd have been able to squeeze in a trip down to Houston to be in the control room with you. Well, next time we'll uh, we'll hopefully get you here. Uh, Cheryl is a partner manager for the uh, for United Launch Alliance, uh, one of the seven. Uh, partners in the commercial crew program, and uh, we wanted to take an opportunity to talk to all seven, and um, uh, Cheryl will close out our week. Uh, um, and Cheryl, I always start with a little biographical information, so tell us all about yourself, uh, where you grew up, uh, and uh, how you got to NASA. Oh, okay. Um, I was um, born and raised on Florida's Space Coast, so I've been watching rockets launch from my backyard all my life. Um, my parents both worked for NASA during the Apollo era, so that um, sort of makes me a second-generation space baby. I like to tell folks I've been at NASA forever, and I think you got a picture as my proof there. Um, most folks um, assume that, that I just followed naturally in my um, parents' footsteps, but that's not quite the case. Um, I went to the local community college, Brevard Community College, and graduated as a, a medical lab technician and worked in the local hospital for a while. And um, then I decided I wanted to be an electrical engineer, and I didn't know it at the time, but that's pretty much a natural step for med techs. Um, I went to Florida Tech, which is um, used to be Florida Institute of Technology, and while I was there, I co-opted with NASA's um, biomedical engineering group, and that sort of blended um, both experiences really well. And um, after I graduated, NASA offered me a job working life science space lab missions. Do you remember space labs? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, um, my favorite was uh, Space Lab Japan, uh, working with their um, Japanese life science teams. That was a great opportunity. Um, NASA has also um, provided me an opportunity to go to school at night and earn my uh, master's in engineering management from the University of Central Florida. And just recently, I've um, got a certificate in space systems engineering from the Stevens Institute of Technology. Um, and I think just, you know, excuse me, learning is just a part of NASA's culture. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, how, uh, so, you know, that's how you got here. Well, what, did, what did you do before you uh, joined the commercial crew program? Um, after Space Labs, I actually moved over to the Launch Services Program. They, um, they moved that program during here to the Kennedy Space Center, and I helped um, start that program here. And um, I had the opportunity to lead teams um, launching NASA missions on extendable launch vehicles, including those from ULA. So that's where the relationship um, started being built with ULA. And um, LSP offered me a whole range of opportunities from um, being responsible for sending teams downrange to Africa and Australia to, to capture downrange telemetry and um, also um, doing the first orbital mission from the Kodiak Launch Complex in Alaska. Wow, that's pretty impressive. It's uh, a wide range for sure. <laughs> no kidding. Um, well, talk to us a little bit about your role now as a partner manager. Um, you know, what what do you do as a partner manager for ULA, and 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 what is your role? Um, partner manager sounds like a jam job, doesn't it? I'm going to go out and manage partners, and and that <laughs> is so not the case. Um, first and foremost, we're partners um, with ULA. I, I serve as an interface between our pit crew. I think you've talked about that. Our teams are partner integration teams and ULA. And um, we um, foster a good relationship. Um, we foster collaboration in areas where we have experience that, that they might be looking for. We're trying to, to break down barriers and facilitate an understanding of our understanding of what commercial means to them and their understanding of what human spaceflight means to us. Um, and something I'm not sure you've heard too much about for the, for the partner managers is we also advocate for our partners within the program. Um, that sort of sounds like I've changed badges, but that's not the case. Um, what the program needs to hear from the seven partner managers is how decisions that they're making are affecting uh, the partners and, and the program gets a cross view of how those decisions may imp be impacting several partners. And um, so each of the partners does that advocacy back into the program and allows them to see how decisions could be affecting all of the partners. 
Uh, you talked about the pit crew, and uh, you know Ed Mango. You mentioned that earlier in the week. Uh, uh, is a pretty impressive group of people that you guys put together. Um, you know to support you, I guess, in in the role as a partner manager, right? That's true. Um, my um, pit crew, if I can brag on them for a minute, they're actually they are Matrix, and Ed did mention that they're from Marshall and JSC. We've got some time from Linkley and KSC. Um, all together with the Launch Services Program as well. And they, they bring a wealth of experience both in um, human space flight and um, Atlas V experience because, again, that's why the Launch Services Program is currently flying. And, um, you know, we've, we've got folks that have worked shuttle and Aries and 1X. And so all of that um, experience together allows them to gain an understanding back and forth as well as share that data with um, United Launch Alliance. Talk about uh, the Space Act agreement part of this. Uh, it's a new way of doing business, but how, how are you integrated with ULA? Um, Ed did mention earlier in the week that um, there were four funded and three unfunded, and ULA is an unfunded. Um, we are further along in the in the technology. Ed was talking about the the funded um, went to you know um, development risk areas, and United Launch Alliance has 29 successful Atlas V launches already. Um, they've been flying that heritage vehicle for a very long time, and although it's you know it's not suitable for human spaceflight right now. All of that um, data and technology has has allowed ULA to gain confidence in their vehicle, so they really know how it operates, and um, that will allow them to to make the unique accommodations that are required to human spaceflight. Um, it'll allow them to do that better with the understanding of how their vehicle already flies. Um, I know I'm going to jump around a little bit because we, we've only got a about five more minutes or so, but okay. uh, I know you had a, a video that uh, you asked us to prepare for you. I, if you if this is a good time, uh, I'd like for you to either show that or talk to it for us, if you don't mind. Sure. If you want to um, if you want to go ahead and play it, I'll talk to it. And um, what I'm showing you, it, and actually it starts with uh, a, an Atlas V launch and processing, um, and those are, those always get your blood going. But um, one of the design modifications that ULA will require is an emergency detection system, and they've already done some work on this. Um, ULA developed a prototype of the emergency detection system and the processor and, ser and the software um, that are going to required, be required to um, monitor the launch vehicles. So in, in using this vehicle for human spaceflight, you've got to also have the ability to board the crew in case something's going wrong with the vehicle or the spacecraft. So what you're watching is um, just some interaction between my team and the ULA team on looking at the software and the algorithms and doing the bottoms up review on how those uh, failures might be detected, which sensors you would be looking at, and, and what is a backup corroboration sensor that would say, yeah, the tank pressure might be falling, um, are we losing acceleration, those types of measurements. And after they've done a, an extensive review of the software, um, we actually took it to the SIL lab, or the Software Integration Lab, which is a, a high-fidelity laboratory, and demonstrated with hardware that that the um, emergency detection software was doing what it was supposed to. And what's really important about this is you want to be able to do two things with an emergency detection system. You want to be able to get off a rocket that's, that's got an issue or a spacecraft that's got an issue, and you want to be really, really sure you don't get off a bad rocket. So you want to be able to, to do that in both directions. You want that detection system to work just, just right. Well, you probably touched on it in your video, but um, um, with a couple minutes we have left, uh, can you talk about some of the uh, milestones uh, that uh, ULA has accomplished thus far and what's uh, ahead of them? Okay. Um, so last um, September they did a design equivalency review. Um, that's where ULA decided that they would do their own evaluation of the design they're flying against the um, Commercial Crew Program's 1100 series. So that allowed them to see if there were gaps in, in where um, they would need to do something different with the Atlas V. Uh, and, and that started, you know, started the um, conversations between our team and their team on on what would meet the intent and what would be acceptable for human spaceflight. 
And they finished that, that review with a tailored systems requirements review in um, December of 2011. And it came down to um, four major areas that would require um, modifications to fly humans. One was the emergency detection system that you've already um, heard about. Um, they're going to do what's called a managed flight profile for structural reasons. Um, one thing we don't think too much about is that this vehicle will launch from um, Launch Complex 41, and that has no way to get the crew in or out at this point or an egress system, so that's one of the ones that's kind of obvious. And then they're going to look at a dual-engine Centaur, um, which will improve the capability of the vehicle. So those are four main things that we're working on right now, um, and they're evaluating and doing the testing on that. Um, so their upcoming um, systems requirements review in mid-June will report out on how they're doing and developing those designs. And uh, it's just a tremendous amount of work, and I think you've laid that out uh, beautifully in the in the time we have here. And um, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. In fact, all of the commercial crew uh, program experts that joined us all week, but uh, uh, that was a great way of uh, wrapping up the week, Cheryl, and we appreciate you joining us uh, here in Mission Control. Oh, well, thanks very much for having me. Thanks again. That was Cheryl uh, Malloy, the Commercial Crew Program's Partner Manager uh, for United Launch Alliance, one of the seven uh, uh, partners involved uh, in the Commercial Crew Program.